So the Barkley marathons are a race unlike any other. And if you want to see how true that statement is, you have to check out this documentary that blew my mind away. You talk about 30 for 30 levels of detail. You talk about classmanship when it comes to documentaries, when you're hitting the sports world. And we are excited to bring in the guy who filmed it, who edited it, who did all the crazy stuff a director needs to do of the 2023 Barkley Marathon documentary is Michael Dillon. Michael, um, I don't even know where to begin because as somebody, Paul and I are huge film fans and I started watching this. I'm like, okay, this is pretty intriguing. This is pretty interesting. Oh my goodness. This is going to be a rabbit hole that I'm going to go down, isn't it? How did this come together? This, this journey of finding what seems to be the fight club that nobody talks about and getting in with this, uh, this little community. Yeah. I think I had the same experience you did just about five or six years earlier. Once you learn about the race, it just keeps sort of sucking you in with every new detail that that you pick up on. Um, I first heard about it, I think it was 2015. Um, I was at a film festival in Seattle for a different project I had worked on. And there was a documentary there about the race. And it was the first time I'd ever heard of it. And that documentary is still out. I think you can find it on YouTube, um, Barkley Marathons, The Race That Eats Its Young. And I just was like totally sucked in. Um, by the runners, by the course, by Laz, the race director, and my good friend, Joe McConaughey, who uh, my documentary focuses on, me and him have worked on a number of different projects. And I think basically since then, he's wanted to run it and I've wanted to film it. And as you learn, as you learn more about the race, getting into the race for runners is difficult. There's like a pretty secretive application process. Even when you figure that out, they only let 40 runners in every year. So Joe's been applying for five years to get in, and this is the first time he was accepted. And then there's also a limited amount of media spaces that the race director holds. And we were able to get the last one. And I was able to get that by going through Joe, who reached out to the race director on my behalf. So um, I just managed to get in sort of last one in, according to Laz. And yeah, it was it was awesome to be there. I mean, being there in person is everything that that you want it to be based on you know the videos that I had seen. It's just like a really one of a kind experience. So before we get into it, John, well, Polly, I want to throw it to you in a second, but I wanted to get this out of the way because anybody who watches this, this is the Thanos, the Vader, the Luke, yeah. whatever character it is. All right, Polly, you know where I'm going to go with. I'll give it to you. Go ahead, buddy. Yeah, so you you wanted to talk about Lazarus oh, Lake, please. Lazarus <laughs> race director, and and yeah, that going into that, I mean, I, obviously he's such a character. Were you expecting him to be like who he was that you saw in that documentary that clued you into what the Barkley marathons were? Yeah, you you never know. I mean, th- he's like that even more so in that original documentary. I think they spend more time focusing on him and showing up. I was just, I was wondering how much of that is him performing when he has an audience versus how much is that who he is all the time. And that's who he is all the time. Um, the day before the race, they invite the media to come out and film him putting up one book. Um, you know, the race has checkpoints, their books hidden in the woods, and we get to film him and meet him the day before. And from the moment I got out of my car and just like walk up to where he is, he's already going. He's got one liner after one liner. He's got a comment about everything. He doesn't need an audience. He's just making jokes for himself. And if like you're there and you can keep up, it's it's the best. Um, so, yeah, there was no shortage of of material with him. Um, yeah, I mean, there's I mean, there's stuff on the cutting room floor, of just like comments he's making and, um, you know great insights that he's got. So Paulie, I think we agree. Uh, Michael, you did a great job of spotlighting him. It was an intriguing character that really fleshes out the universe. That is this community of, of, of a marathon runners, but then will really just, I think blew my mind the most beyond the characters is the athletic part of it. Because when I first saw this, it almost, and this is how you can't judge a book by its cover. I'm like, is this more like an activity, a hobby? Like what? And then you realize that these are supreme ultra marathon athletes. They're just normal people. They you walk across them every single day. They're not six foot eight. They're not 300 pounds. They're not these gigantic, what we think are super athletes, but they are super athletes. Were you surprised? Even though I guess you you're with friends with John, who really for a first timer showed out like a baller. Like, what were you surprised? Just the dedication, the amount of athleticism, the the amounts of sacrifice and the amount of teamwork, which really caught me off guard that takes place in these marathons. 
Yeah. So I've, I've worked with Joe in a couple of different projects. He's um, his big thing is what's known as fastest known time attempts. Uh, they're called FKTs. So he hikes these big, you know, 800,000, 2000 mile long trails and he goes out and he tries to do them, you know, faster than anyone's done them before. And so I've been with him on a couple of those trips and uh, just a couple of years ago, he did the Arizona trail, which is 800 miles from Mexico to Utah. And he had a crew on that trip led by his wife, Katie, who was also his crew at the Barkley. And so I'd seen them work together and how she leads a crew and how she like how much of a team effort it is. So that wasn't too surprising for me. What was surprising was how stacked the field was at Barkley this year. And that's funny because like if you haven't heard of the race, you're not going to know any of these names. But if you have followed the race at all and you sort of know a little bit about the ultra running world, like I feel like after we got there and we saw who else was sort of rolling up to camp, it was like, oh, man, they're here. They're here. Like and the weather this year was really good, which isn't always the case. And so there was a lot of talk beforehand um, amongst the runners and the crews. It was like, wow, this could be a year that a couple different people finish, if not even more than that. You know, it's funny because I met, I said John John was one of the guys that. John again. Kelly, yeah, yeah, yep. uh, awesome. Joe showed out really well, like a baller for a yes. first timer. And you saw this is where the team aspect. I mean, the the van life and everything. But as a director, what what were you looking for when this project came together? Was it the characters? Was it going to be the the grind of it? Were as a creator, but somebody who I assume a pre- like sports on some level, whether it's a super fan or just as a casual viewer, like that world of it as a director what were you looking to tell the story of beyond just your friend who's doing some amazing stuff and the people surrounding him but this entire story yeah i think what i really wanted to do is just show what it feels like to be there um you know it's a really hard race to plan for because you don't know how successful anyone's going to be you know joe could have gone out there and gotten lost on the first loop and then that's his experience um and you know so beforehand i tried a little bit to to talk to other runners um, introduce myself in case, you know, their story sort of turned into something bigger. And, you know, if something happened to Joe, we could sort of veer off. Um, but really the Laz restricts media access just to the camp and to one spot on the course, which you have to hike to. Um, so you can't really follow the runners all that much when they're on course. So my goal originally was just tell Joe's story, um, you know, get that out there. Cause I know he's such a talented athlete and he's a good friend. But then beyond that, to sort of give the audience, you know, the feeling of being at camp. And one of the reasons that Laz even has space for media media um, at camp is because it's such a restrictive space. They have to comply with uh, state park guidelines. They can't have an audience come in. So he res- reserves those spots for media because he wants people to get a chance who can't make it to see what happened at the race. And it has such a big following that I knew it was just like, People just want to see what happened this year. You know, you're going to hear the stories online. You're going to see Keith Dunn's Twitter account, but to actually see how it went down um, is what a lot of the audience is looking for. And so that was the original goal is just put people at camp and then whatever develops, follow it as best I can. And, you know, you don't know what's going to happen each year. So um, I feel very lucky that the stories sort of developed the way they did. This was an incredible year to be there. Um, But yeah, I mean, it's, it's impossible to plan for. Polly. I feel like we should describe what the Barkley marathons are for those listening that. Don't yeah, for get sure. It. Yeah. So could you, could you kind of give like your best explanation as to what sets this race apart from other races? Sure. So the Barkley marathons are uh, it's called a 100 mile race, but runners and crew all agree that it's closer to 130 miles and it takes place in the mountains of Tennessee. Um, it happens every March, but the dates are always kept secret as much as possible and runners are challenged to run five loops through the woods, um, five 20 to 25 mile loops, more or less. And they're not allowed to have any technology or GPS. So at the beginning of the race, a course map is placed out one map with the route and runners have to get their own maps and mark their own trail, figure out their own compass bearings and all that. And then when they're on course, the way they prove they've run the actual course is they have to find books that are being that have been hidden in the woods. And then they have to tear out a page from that book that corresponds to their bib number. When they get back to camp, they hand over all of their pages to Lazarus Lake, the race director. He counts them, makes sure you hit every book, and then you have some time with your crew and you have to get right back on trail essentially because you have 60 hours to complete it. And it's not just a 60 hour cutoff, you have to finish each lap in under 12 hours to be allowed to go back out on the next lap. So there's a cutoff every 12 hours. Um, 
where it takes place in Tennessee and at the time of year it is in March, weather is typically a huge obstacle. You can get snow, you can get high heat, you can get really dense fog. The race takes place off trail, so there's no trail to follow. You're sort of just navigating through the woods. So if it turns out to be a little bit foggy and you make one wrong turn, like your race could be over. So yeah, it's it's a really remote race that sort of gained a bit of a following over the past few years as documentaries have come out about it. Um, yeah, I'm wondering if there's any any big points that you think I might have missed. No, I think you you hit all of them. Um, it, it just more and more creates this image that Lazarus Lake is kind of an evil genius. I was reading about some of his other races and there's like one where you get um, the amount of time based on what your age is and however you yep. go. Yeah, the, I think it's like the ages race or something like that. Um, but I wanted to talk about Joe McConaughey, the subject of your film. Uh, you mentioned that he has like the Arizona fastest known time. And I, I actually happened to watch that film that you made racing Arizona. And that's another compelling uh, documentary just about his journey as well as uh string bean where he uh, does the Appalachian trail in 45 days, which is just mind boggling. Yeah. How did you meet Joe? How did, how did uh, you foster this relationship where he became uh, kind of your primary muse for these documentaries? Yeah. So Joe and I went to college together. And he was on the track team. We were different years, but he was on the track team. And one of my really good friends who has also been part of Joe's crew in a number of these trips, Jordan Ham, uh, was on the track team. So I met Joe through Jordan. The year after I graduated, Joe announced he was going to go after the Pacific Crest Trail fastest known time. So that was in the summer of 2014. He was going to try and hike the 2600 mile trail from Mexico to Canada, goes through California, Oregon and Washington. And he's going to try and do it in like under 54 days, I think was the record. And when I first heard that, I was like, there's no way. There's no way that happens. Um, but then my friend Jordan announced that he was going to be his crew and his lead. And I was like, well, if Jordan thinks there's a chance, maybe there is. And so I reached out to them back then to see if they'd be interested in having me film it. And they were all on board. And basically from that first trip, um, you know, every year, I mean, I'm in touch with Joe all the time, but every year he's got a new project that he's working on. And I mean, I'm always you know, in general, just a sports fan and a fan of Joe. And like, I'm always happy to go and, and see what he's up to and, and document it as best I can. Michael Dillon joins us today here on the Sports Cubicle. It's Paul Shavari. I'm Mike Mercado, an amazing director, amazing editing skills. You did a great job when it came to building this universe. Check out the Barkley Marathons documentary, doing great numbers on YouTube. So shout out to you and everybody who's involved in this project, because as we know, to gain traction on YouTube and social media to and, and something that People are starting to explore and to really be part of the zeitgeist. I think that's a, a huge kudos to you and the staff and the passion. I think that's the one thing that I, I really wanted to get into is the passion that you see from not just the spectators, not just the athletes, but the organizers. And now this lore that's being built. Like how how big do you think they want this to become? How popular? Like obviously they're doing invites, so there is some kind of exclusivity to it, and they want it to be special. And we know Laz, the kind of character that he is. But do you think that they want this to be something bigger than it is? Not a, a, a huge NFL, but bigger. Do you think that that's kind of what the culture wants? For this race specifically? Yeah. Uh, you know what? I think Laz is pretty happy with with where it is. It's probably bigger than anyone would imagined it, was, it would get when it first started. Um, I do know that a, a big part of the reason that he likes to have the media there and sharing the story is that by building this sort of contingency of, you know, an audience and of a fan, it helps protect the race. There was a year, I forget what year it was exactly, but I think that the state shut the race down. They, it was um, to help protect the land in the state park. And I think it was because the race had enough followers and enough fans that sort of reached out on behalf of it, that they then allowed it. And now they work with Laz to have a, uh, like a pretty strict set of rules and guidelines that the race has to follow. You know, the Barkley has this sort of aura around it of being secretive and, you know, and hidden. A lot of that is just because they're trying to protect the area and the land that the race takes place on. So it's, it's an interesting balance of wanting there to be a following and an audience, but not wanting people to feel the need to show up and, you know, ruin the relationship they have with the state park. But I mean, all of the biggest names pretty much in the ultra running world know about it. And if I don't know how much bigger it can get than that for them, I don't think there are any athletes out there who, you know, might be able to do it, who aren't already aware of it. So 
And I know at this year, Keith, Keith Dunn runs a Twitter account. He runs a Twitter account from camp. It's the only Twitter account that the Barkley allows. And I think it was trending top 10 on Twitter during the race. So I feel like the audience is there. It's pretty big already. Um, I don't think there's any, any hope for growth. And I don't think Laz is really making any money off of it at this point. So it's not like there's more money to be made for him. Michael, I wanted to, I'm going to throw it to Paul in a second, but I wanted to maybe get to know the guy behind the camera for a second. And, and that's more what you get out of this besides cheering on friends, besides seeing amazing human interest stories. Do you get excited for these journeys, for these adventures? Do you get physically and mentally prepared for what you're about to do? It's not like, yeah, maybe you get to rest a little bit, but you have to be ready for a moment to happen. You have to have that camera up and ready to go. And that could be at 8.54 when somebody's going to con shell or waiting till 8.54 for that alarm to say you have an hour left. How, what, do you still get excited? Do you get enjoyment? Do you get challenged by doing these adventures? A hundred percent. I mean, I love going on these trips with Joe. Um, and this, this one in particular, you know, the 72 hours between the start of the race and the end, and actually a little bit more before that, um, because you're waiting for the conch shell and you're filming all the, the setup, you know, for three or four days, I think I only slept, you know, maybe 10 or 12 hours, just in one or two hour naps scattered throughout, because you never know when someone's coming into camp. You never know when the race is going to start. That's another aspect of the race is like, there's a 12 hour window when it can start. And so, you know, the whole first night before it even started, me and a lot of other crew and media just stayed up all night around a campfire because you're waiting for Laz to come out and blow a conch shell. So just from the jump, everyone's sleep deprived and exhausted. And to go and see the race at that one other viewing spot, it's like a four or five mile hike, I think. Um, but yeah, no, I, I really like that aspect of it. You know, like I said before, I'm a big sports fan. I played sports growing up. I think the kind of documentaries that I like to shoot involve a little bit of that activity on the filmmaking side, like being able to keep up with the athletes or being able to be active and think on your feet and sort of react as things are happening in real time. Um, I think that's probably where, you know, I'm at my best um, as opposed to, you know, something that's sort of just sat down and really still, I think just because I get the most excited by it. Um, you know, that other documentary you referenced race in Arizona, uh, my good friend, Jack Murphy, who's worked on a number of these projects with me, like, for two weeks, we just got to go out, you know, and shoot all day, every day. Um, and that's so much fun. That's what I wanted to do all my life. Like, so I'm always excited for the next chance to do that. So yeah, whenever Joe's got an idea for one of these things, I'm, I'm always getting excited. Pauly. Uh, I, I came across the trailer for how to break your brand new van. Um, <laughs> And and that seemed like it was maybe like a different production company in in addition to yours. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about what that was all about? I mean, I only saw the first episode with uh, uh, the one guy getting the tick in his hair. Yeah, uh, Justin. But I'm really intrigued now where where this is going, and I thought it was such a cool little documentary. But could you kind of tell us about that project? Was that kind of your baby, or were you kind of tied in with someone that that was uh, coming up with that one? Yeah. So, I mean, outside of what you see on my YouTube channel, I do a lot of freelance work for a number of different companies and organizations. That uh, company in particular, Heartbreak Hill Running Company, is a running company that's originally based out of Boston. They've got a shop in Chicago now, though, uh, in Lincoln Park. And I knew the one of the founders of the company, Justin, the guy who gets the tick. And so that was during COVID. They had Nike had sort of hooked them up with like a souped up VW van, but they built it in... Oregon and they need, or they, you know, designed it in Oregon, they had to get it to Boston. And so he had the idea of just road tripping it. And he was like, if we're going to do this road trip, we might as well film it. He reached out to me again, similar to these trips with Joe. I was like, yeah, I'd love to do a cross country road trip. That sounds awesome. So I produced, you know, a five episode uh, series for them about that trip. And then afterwards there was just so much good footage and like funny moments that I wanted to make it like, you know, a short trailer just to have on my own channel. So that's where that came from. Um, but yeah, I mean, they're a great, company. I've worked with them a bunch on some social media stuff. So yeah, I, again, that was just me shooting and then four of us in a van for, I think five or six days. What, and what just you... to follow up on, on that, um, for just the Chicago aspect for our audience, I came across, uh, the shots that you got around the city right after the COVID shutdown. And it's just some of the most beautiful footage of the city, but also eerie in a way, cause you know, there's just no people out and about yeah. and it, like, it's like a weekday afternoon. And you've got, you know, you've got the Millennium Park Bean, you know, you've got um, just like various shots around like the loop and all that. And uh, 
I, how did that come about? Did you just happen to be in Chicago at the time that the shutdown happened? Yeah, my wife and I lived in Chicago for four years. Oh, okay. Um, and so, yeah, at the time, at the time we were living in Lincoln Park and like, like you said, like it, the shutdown was just so eerie. And especially those areas were like, I'd never seen the bean without, you know, a hundred people or whatever. And so, yeah, it was, I think that was the first or second day of the shutdown. I can't remember the exact dates, but I just got on a, you know, a bike and just sort of went down the lakefront path and dipped in and out of different parts of the city and just got as many shots as I could. Um, I think part of it is I was going a little st- you know, stir crazy. And I was like, I got to get outside and do this. Another part of it was just really curious what those spaces looked like at the time. Um, and yeah, I'm not, now I'm really happy to have that video because like, it doesn't feel like that long ago, but you do sort of forget how deserted everything felt at the time. Um, so yeah, I go back and watch it every now and then just because especially the, around the bean, it was so quiet. And that day was really, really kind of strange. Michael, I, I'm glad Paulie brought that up because there is something to what the artist sees, right? And, you know, Paulie is a musician. I I write and then someone like you who's always filming and capturing these moments. But then we also have our athletic backgrounds from high school all the way on, right? What that grind, how often do you catch yourself constantly looking for the next project or looking at that beautiful shot or wondering like, man, this is something that I like the the bean with nobody being there two days in the how often do you get that urge that like fire to start the next project, look for the next project, get all in on the next project? Uh, all the time. And I wish I had a clear idea of what the next project was more often. You know, like I find myself feeling really unsettled when I don't have something to work on that I'm excited about. Um, but like, for example, with this Barkley documentary, I mean, I'd wanted to shoot that event for a long time. As soon as I got the approval to go, like I just locked in on that. Um, but then since then, since posting and sharing and like the first couple days after sharing is exciting because you're getting lots of feedback, but very quickly, it's like, all right, what's next, you know? Cause I mean, working on these projects for me personally, gives my day a lot of structure. It's like, okay, I'm going to get up at this time. So I want to start editing, you know, get a head start on this next part. And so, yeah, like right now I'm, I'm entertaining the idea for a couple different projects, but nothing that's totally stood out yet. So I'm always trying to figure out what the next thing is. And I wish I had it more often. Well, I is think you don't have anything. That, just to, what, does Joe have any ideas in the tank for his Ooh. next, uh, next Ooh. thing? Okay. Yeah, he's got he's got a couple a uh, couple ideas. Um, there's a there's a, a trail, but he's had you know things come up that have sort of derailed those plans. He's been dealing with some injuries this year. Uh, there was a trail that he set the FKT on a couple years ago, and the John Muir Trail, and that's a pretty historic FKT route. And I think the record he broke had been there for about five years and two weeks after he set the new one, someone else broke his. So his plan was to go out this year and redo it, but there was a big storm and it wiped out a bridge and without that bridge, like you can't do it. Um, So he's got a couple other ideas that he's entertaining. I don't think he's locked into anything yet, but yeah, I'm texting him a couple times a week, just being like any updates, any updates, because Uh yeah, once he decides what his next thing is, if I can make it work, I'm going to be there. That's so good. I love that. I love that. The the grind continues between two awesome friends that are doing some great stuff that we are able to catch. Michael, we could do this all day. I find it fascinating because as much as it's interesting, this race, the characters behind it, just tapping into your brain for 20 minutes and being able to kind of see what got us to this point. The friendship behind it, the fact that these are athletes doing this. And, I, you know, before we go, it, it reminds me a little bit of the Kobe Bryant thing, how he got into the movie making, right? I think there is something to athletic, people who come from athletic backgrounds that just kind of have an eye for telling the story of human interest in the world of athletics. Like when you, we were talking about some of the winners, but um, I'm trying to find her name right now. She, Jasmine. Jasmine Paris. Story. I mean, you being able to catch that though, and knowing it's, it could be the easy low hanging fruit of a woman does that, but you dove a little bit deeper into it and you showed that it's an athlete finding her way to make her impact on this sport. And I think there's something to somebody with an athletic eye and athletic background with a creative touch to it, to be able to draw that out. Was that something that before we let you go, you were able to kind of tap into a little bit? Yeah, I think so. I think that just goes along with, you know, being in that space, I think the runners have a healthy skepticism of the media. You know, this is a very personal thing for them, a very personal challenge. And then for someone to stick a camera in their face can be really sort of jarring. And I think, you know, having a bit of an athletic background, you sort of understand 
or I sort of understand what they're aiming to get at, what they're aiming to achieve. And mostly I think that just helps me relate to them as people first, which then makes them more comfortable having me around. Um, you know, if I didn't know anything about running or anything about, you know, sports generally, it might just be a little harder to connect. And then, so there's that aspect. And then there's just a the physical aspect of, you know, they're not hanging around camp for a long time. So when they check in at the gate, they're running down to their, their campsite, they're running back. Like you got to be able to keep up quick enough to get ahead of them, set up a shot so that you get them completing their full process. And there's a lot of times where I wasn't even able to do that. Um, but yeah, I do think having that background definitely helps, but it also, you know, it explains why this is the kind of story that I'm interested in telling. It's Barkley Marathon's documentary. He's the director, the editor, the guy behind the camera who shows us into that world. It's Michael Dillon. Michael, where else can people find it besides on YouTube? Can they go support you on a website and be ready for any future announcements that you might have down the pipeline? YouTube is probably where I post most frequently. Uh, my production company is called Pilot Field, uh, pilotfield.com or on Instagram at Pilot Field. Those are the places to get to get updates. Um, but yeah, I mean, anything, if you're following on YouTube, you're going to see it all. Make sure you're following us on Twitter at Sports Cubicle TV and on YouTube at the Sports Cubicle. We'll be making sure that we connect with Pilot Field and, of course, Michael Dillon, so you guys can see the interview and links to the amazing documentary, the Barkley Marathons documentary. Paul Shabari, Mike Mercado, we want to thank you, Michael Dillon, for joining us here on the Sports Cubicle. It was an absolute pleasure. Thanks, guys. This was great.